Our next presenter is Patrick Walter, Managing Director of New Century Resources. Patrick is a qualified metallurgist, mineral economist, board member and executive with almost two decades experience going from technical and commercial roles within the mining and water treatment industries. In 2017, New Century was established to acquire the Century Zinc Mine in Queensland. Since the successful restart in 2018, Australia's largest ever tailings reprocessing and hydraulic mining operation has produced 870,000 tonnes of zinc concentrate and is now generating 100 million in operational cash flow per annum, all while rehabilitating the historical environmental footprint at Century. New Century is now focused on extending the Century life of mine and restarting green copper opportunities at Mount Lyle in Tasmania. Welcome, Patrick. Thanks very much. I feel like the uh, the bio stole most of the presentation there, so uh, I'll, uh, steal your thunder. I'll, uh, I'll cover it off in a, in a little bit more detail there. And uh, a big thanks to the, the team at Diggers and Dealers for putting on another great uh, great forum uh, this year. It's uh, it's fantastic to be back, and to the major sponsors, uh, especially Canaccord, um, for providing their support. New Century uh, represents a relatively unique. Uh, value proposition in the uh, in the small to micro cap space on the ASX, uh, in that our valuation is underpinned by actual cash flow. So, the business is cash generative. Uh, we're not uh, specking a valuation that's based on drill hits, uh, feasibility studies, uh, commo future commodity price projections. We actually generate cash, and it underpins the valuation of the business. And we also own our growth projects as well. So you'll see there with the map, we have the Century Zinc mine. We spent five years working very hard to get that operation up and running. It is the 13th largest zinc producer in the world now from the tailings operation itself. There are around 260 operating zinc mines in the world, so it's a significant zinc producer in itself. We also have a number of in-situ de uh, deposits at, that, uh, at the Century mine, which we're now looking to bring online. Uh, and we also have the option over the Mount Lyle copper mine, uh, which we'll go into in some detail in this presentation as well, to give you a, a flavour of that opportunity. Uh, the business has around $118 million in cash and concentrate, no debt in it as well. As I said, we're generating that strong cash flow uh, from our operations, using that cash flow to grow our business. Very good support within the register itself. It's quite a tight register. Um, most recent entrant onto our regis register has been Sabanya Stillwater. Uh, for those who don't know Sabanya, they're an approximately $7 billion diversified miner, uh, PGM and gold miner. Very strong support uh, and a mandate for growth um, utilising Sabanya. It's fantastic to have them on our register and, uh, and uh, providing that support. A quick look at what we have achieved at Century to date. Uh, in in uh, 2017, five years ago to the day, we, uh, we launched New Century uh, and we had a vision of restarting the mine, facilitating what we, what we call economic rehabilitation, generating value from what is ultimately the rehabilitation of the Century mine site, utilising the vast infrastructure at the mine. Now, five years ago, I think, you know, the only notable thing we'd done was sponsor the kebab shop um, up the main street. Um, so we, we've come a long way since then. Uh, we, we so we launched New Century in, say, July 2017. By the end of 2018, we'd restarted the operations. By the end of 2019, we were the 13th largest zinc producer in the world. So from that endeavour, from that hard work, we realised that the value proposition of the strategy of New Century was quite strong. You simply cannot achieve that sort of growth with a traditional explore, discover, develop, operate model. That's a 10 to 15 year model. New Century has been able to achieve that production rate within two years of, of its existence uh, occurring. So we plan to replicate that model over and over again, targeting brownfield assets, either restarting them or, uh, or turning them around and optimising them, uh, and also looking at potential tailings reprocessing opportunities as well. So there's multiple prongs to the strategy, but in principle we, we target sunk capital and we look at uh, utilising that sunk capital to continue operations or restart operations, utilising that material. So I said, we're a top 15 zinc producer in the world. We produce nearly 900,000 tonnes of zinc concentrate to date from the existing operations, utilising all of that sunk capital. Uh, and it's also important to note that we actually haven't started 
a new mine. So fundamentally what we produce is green zinc. You, you couldn't get any more literal than that. So we pull it out of the tailing stem, it was considered a waste product, and we've put nearly a million tonnes of concentrate into the market to date uh, of, of green zinc. So very strong uh, ESG flavour to everything we do. And you'll see down at Mount Lyle, uh, when I show you that uh, very similar model of producing green copper down at Mount Lyle. So the cash flow we produce is green. Uh, we've uh, had eight quarters in a row now of positive operational cash flow. Uh, nearly $100 million um, operational cash flow from the operations in the last 12 months. Of all of the companies reporting Appendix 5Bs on the ASX, of which there's about 660 companies that do that, uh, last calendar year, we made the third most operational cash flow of any of those companies that report on there. So again, uh, compared to peers in the, in the small cap space, we're generating good, strong operational cash flow. Uh, we also have an exciting development project. Our first kickoff of hard rock mining will occur at the Century Mine and starting with Silver King. So located on the mining lease, um, and we'll go into it in some detail on further slides there, but you can see the value proposition uh, on the slide there about Silver King. And the reality is it's, it's highly value accretive. You're talking sort of nearly 100% IRRs. The reason being is the tailings are paying all the bills. So you think about it, power, water, people, services, it's all there, all in operation at the moment. Silver King has to pay for its own mining costs, sure. But that's why we're able to get such good value accretion from bringing on these additional assets that are already on this mine site that already utilise the existing sunk capital that's in play there. We have reserves out to 2027. We have defined resources out to 2030. So without even assuming any additional discoveries at all, we will be operating to 2030. We also have significant phosphate mineralisation in our tenements that utilises exactly the same processing infrastructure. We are going to bring uh, that development to market over the next 12 months, so we'll be looking to bolt on our mine life well into 2040 plus, given the size of these, uh, these phosphate opportunities. It's also worth noting the strategic nature of the infrastructure we acquired. So Pasminko built Sentry in 1990, and they spent the best part of $2 billion doing it. So amazing original asset. The big zinc ore body was 120 million tonnes at 12% zinc and lead. Completely stranded. 300 kilometres north of Mount Isa, it needed a logistics solution. So they, they built the 9 million tonne per annum processing plant, they built a 700 man camp, private airport with sealed runway, they built a 300 kilometre underground slurry pipeline, still to date the largest single pump slurry transfer pipeline in the world, dedicated port facility in Corumba and transshipment vessel. In 2017 we acquired all of that infrastructure, all of that sunk capital, and that's what we're leveraging to get back up and running. And the reality is any discoveries that occur within, say, a 100 kilometre radius of the Century Mine site, they are going up that pipeline there because there is simply no other economic route for the transport of bulk concentrates in this region. For example, if we didn't have that pipeline, we'd be trucking concentrate 300 k's to Mount Isa and then railing it 1,400 kilometres to Townsville. So it's a totally different value proposition there. So, we have plenty of resources already on our tenements for, to operate for multiple decades, but absolutely we look forward to more discoveries in the region and uh, talking to them about uh, shared infrastructure use, whether it's the pipeline, the port facility or anything like that. So fantastic strategic infrastructure that we own and we fully plan to keep utilising it um, for decades to come. Very quick overview of the, of the uh, quarter that just gone by. As I said, um, we produced around $25 million of operational cash flow from the business. We achieved our revised guidance numbers, tick under 120,000 tonnes of zinc metal production, 13th largest zinc producer in the world, and C1 costs are just over 90 cents a pound there. We're debt free, we have $118 million in cash and concentrate in the bank, and importantly, we're pragmatically investing our operational cash flows in our growth projects. So we're not wasting the money at all, we're actually using it for future cash generation activities as well. So we get to use that, um, that benefit of not having to go back to the well uh, and grab it off shareholders or get anything like that. We can actually invest our cash flows to grow them even further and extend the longevity and the profitability of the business. Doing a bit of a deep dive on the century asset itself as a planned view of the operations. One of the key things that we achieve at Century 
is economic rehabilitation. So we've actually achieved a 23% reduction in environmental bonding on the site today by continuing operations. We're the only company, only operating mine in Queensland history that's actually achieved its a reduction in its bonding while being in operation because quite simply what we do is rehabilitation every day. So we pick tailings up out of the original pit there. We hydraulically mine it using the evaporation dam water, bring it up through about eight kilometres of pipe work it's reprocessed in the existing green processing plant there. That processing plant is about 250 metres long. And fundamentally, all of it ends up back in the pit. And we rehabilitate the site via processes known as subaqueous deposition, or we put tailings underwater back in the pit there. So reducing the surface area of disturbance every day and obviously generating a profit uh, from doing that activity. Silver King, as I said, is the next mine that we're going to bring online, and it's really the first of a series of daisy chains of in situ developments here. The Silver King resource itself, you can see we've started the development work on it. Only about seven weeks ago, we actually achieved environmental approvals that we need for that, so we can really start to look to kick that into gear in due course as well. <coughs> Excuse me. We have looked to maintain the timeline, uh, particularly around long lead items on Silver King while we were achieving these approvals. And you can see on the right hand side some of the typical long lead items that, uh, that have slowed projects up. We have uh, been able to acquire and maintain those timelines there, particularly around equipment and access to semiconductors on, in vehicles, that sort of thing as well. The Silver King mine itself is just a beautiful high grade ore body there. You can see its uh, reserves are running currently 2.3 million tonnes at 11% zinc and lead inside a mineral resource space of 3.7 million tonnes, 10% zinc and lead in itself. Open at depth, we've only drilled it down to 350 metres. There's no point in drilling further from surface. We've got a great resource. We've got four years of reserve life already in play. We get the decline in and we start doing exploration down dip from there to keep extending the life of it. So four years is planned to be four years for the next 10 years plus, uh, as with a lot of these vein style deposits that, that occur. It's actually got some additional mineralisation at surface and we'll keep uh, looking to, to drill that out and define it up as we get up, up and running. The asset itself, as I said, Silver King is one of many uh, identified vein style targets. There are pro approximately 40 identified veins on the century tenements. So the big zinc ore body itself, the, the big 120 million tonne ore body is a sediment hosted deposit, or SEDEX sediment hosted deposit, whereas these veins are considered to be feeders or potential feeders uh, for those sediment hosted deposits as well. So smaller in tonnes, higher in grade or potentially higher in grade. But for us, for New Century, which doesn't actually have a, a sunk capital bill to pay off, we look at these as just great feed to keep extending the mine life of the operation and keep leveraging that sunk cap capital base that we have. So we said our first asset is Silver King. Coming right up behind that is Watson's Load. It's currently 1.7 million tonnes at nearly 10% zinc and lead. We've, we've drilled about 700 metres of a known four kilometre strike. It remains open at depth. And we'll bring this one into the resource model even further and eventually into the reserve model uh, as we go forward. And it becomes a daisy chain effect. And after Watson's load, I could reel off a dozen other identified targets that are, are just going to follow the same model. And we learn with each one. They're quite complex uh, underground ore bodies, but we learn with our drilling, uh, drilling plans and exploration on each one. We become more and more competent in defining them up and we'll continue to bring them into the mine life. One of the interesting opportunities that we've also uh, discovered is, is a potential for another big zinc style mineralisation, so large bulk tonnage mineralisation down at the Lilydale Prospects. So it's really a, a case of, of looking for a Goldilocks scenario where you have century host rocks, which are called PMH4, and you have these vein style feeders in and around them that may have, have flowed through when the mineralisation was, uh, was in liquid form um, many, many years ago. So. Uh, we see an opportunity down at the Lilydale Prospect. We've just got cultural clearance uh, to go and drill that and test that, and ultimately that's what we'll do. Is we'll we'll um, seek to see if there's another big zinc style mineralisation on the uh, piece of mineralisation on the ore body. And if it's not Lilydale, uh, there's a number of other prospects up at Edith and other areas which we'll continue to test for the large bulk tonnage project as well. Switching over now to Mount Lyle. So as I said, Mount Lyle is our development project. Uh, it's a large, significantly large copper resource uh, down in Tasmania, highly analogous to what we've achieved at Century. So the mine itself has a 130 year operating history. 
In fact, Mount Lyle up until 1950 was the largest copper producer in the British Empire, only to be surpassed by MIM up in Queensland. So a significant amount of history in terms of Australian mining, also a significant amount of sunk capital. So mining leases in place, it's obviously a tier one jurisdiction. It utilises 100% hydroelectric power. It has a tailings dam that's fully compliant and permitted. It has around 28 kilometres of underground mine development. It is on care and maintenance, you get access to it every day. There's 20 people on site doing a great job uh, maintaining the ventilation, maintaining the water treatment, maintaining all the electrical works underground and on surface. And that's resulting in, a, in what is, is really a restart ready operation from an underground perspective. So 28 kilometres of underground development has an approximate value of around $230 million, let alone the actual time to develop that sort of infrastructure. And it gives us direct access to the ore body we are actually drilling uh, right against those ore faces down there at the moment. As you can see here, the ore body is split into four or five different pieces. There's four underground assets, a lot of them are open at depth, and there's also a couple of significant open pit uh, developments there. The, um, the key with Mount Lyle is actually focus. There are so many opportunities down there, you actually narrow your focus to know where to start. The most obvious area to focus is actually on the deposits which have the existing underground development. Mount Lyle contains 1.2 million tonnes of copper in mineral resource and nearly a million ounces of gold in mineral resource, spread across 140 million tonnes of defined mineral resources. So again, these are not exploration targets, these are not based on drill hits, these are mineral resources which now has a 250,000 tonne reserve in place. This is a beast of an ore body and we're going to spend the time to build the plant, to restart the operations in what will ultimately be a multi-decade activity down there producing green copper. As I said, it's 100% hydroelectric power down there at Mount Lyle, so it's fundamentally a green copper operation that we have down there as well. Zeroing in on, on the focus there, as I said, Prince Lyle and Western Tharsis, where the historical operations occurred, are the focus of our business. You can see the, uh, the grey pictures there around the decline, so the decline had a historical capacity of around 2.4 million tonnes per annum. Keep in mind, it's 140 million tonne reserve there, so you can do the maths on how good mine life can be. You'll see also there, there's a shaft that needs refurbishment, has an opportunity there for anywhere up to 3 million tonnes per annum as well. So you've got expansion opportunities um, abound. We're drilling here at the moment, at the very top of the cave, and we plan to do exactly what they've done for the last 27 years on site, which is sub-level caving, all the way down the existing pipe. So the original Prince Lyle cave pipe, they've uh, processed 74 million tonnes, and nearly 1.3% gram, 1 .3 copper, nearly a million tonnes of copper is produced there. They've been sub-level caving there since 1995, and we plan to do exactly the same thing. It's the key thing about Mount Lyle, we're not doing anything special, we're going to restart the operations and do exactly the same thing, and I'll show you some financial metrics on what could be achieved in doing that as well. Looking quickly above surface, and this is the big question, is how much is it going to cost to restart and how much effort is going to be required there? So the plant on surface or a portion of the plant on surface needs to be rebuilt. We could look, if we had a five to ten year mine life, we may look at refurbishment and restart. But the reality is this needs to be done right and done once and have a multi-decade operation in play for us as well. Very simple metallurgy. Um, now you're talking about crush grind, and it's a, a coarse grind flotation of 106 micron. Flow to concentrate, which contains about 26-27% copper concentrate with a gold credit, and then you sell it. That's it. So there's no SXEW, there's no autoclaves or roasters or anything fancy down here. This is simple sublevel caving, and then simple metallurgy at surface, which has been done for decades and we plan to restart it doing exactly the same thing. We have a PFS underway at the moment, which will be available around September or October this year. It'll be the first time numbers have been released on Mount Lyle in approximately two decades. That will roll straight into a DFS, which will be done in the second half of next year, and from there we can make the important decision to launch uh, and restart the operations here. So a great opportunity come the end of 2024, start of 2025, that we can see Mount Lyle back in operation again. We, we take it through its paces, we do it right, uh, a great opportunity for us to, to have that uh, 30,000 odd tonnes of copper production. Just to give you some um, references to the history, as I said, the, 
The operation for the last decade, since it went on care and maintenance in 2014, was producing 25 to 30,000 tonnes of copper, 10 to 15,000 ounces of gold, year in, year out. And it was doing it at all in sustaining costs of, of around $2 a pound. So $2 a pound in 2014, you could argue there's, there's inflationary pressures against that. But the gold price is twice. Uh, twice what it was back then as well. So you're getting very good uh, economics from the operation. $2 a pound, the operation was historically producing around 70 million payable pounds. So even with the copper price coming off, it's still $3.50 a pound. You're looking at potential to net $1.50 a pound on 70 million pounds of production there. So uh, a great economic value proposition. You'll see on the graph on the right hand side, consistent cash flow generation there, averaging about $70 million a year in its last, uh, last 10 years of operations. Copper price is significantly higher since operations were stopped back in 2014. So what have we done? We've initially re-established the reserves. We had around 130% increase in those reserves uh, as we put them in place. And it's put Mount Lyle straight back on the map as one of the top copper mines in Australia. So this, again, is a graph of uh, top Australian copper mines by reserves, so not mineral resources or anything else. This is actual reserves in place. And Mount Lyle sitting right next to C CSA, which is currently being bought for $1.2 billion, or Jake's uh, Ernest Henry mine, which is, uh, he bought the other half of that, around 30,000 tonnes of copper production uh, for around a billion dollars as well. Jake's reference points were fantastic. It, Seven million ounce uh, gold equivalent resource. Mount Lyle is six million ounces in itself. We've got a huge opportunity. Sure, we've got to restart it, but that's what the team has a skill set in. Brownfield asset restarts. We see a great opportunity um, for us there as we bring this back online. I'll finish up there. I'll just finish by saying the, um, uh, uh, summarising the activities of New Century. As I said, we have a fundamental value proposition which is based on actual cash flow. We own our growth projects and we're pragmatically investing in them and progressively bringing them online as well. So focus of the next 12 to 18 months is about bringing Silver King online as we're doing the studies at Mount Lyle. Silver King comes online, then we have our projects team down at Mount Lyle delivering the operational restart there. So very systematic way of bringing things online and we utilise all the skills and learnings that we've had on creating new century and making that into uh, the, the century mine into the 13th largest zinc producer in the world. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a booth, uh, number 10. Please come and talk to us. Barry Harris, our COO, and James McNamara, our Head of Investor Relations, are also here. So please come and ask us all the questions at the booth and spend a bit of time there. There's plenty to discuss. Thank you. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, any questions out there for Patrick? Well, it looks like you're getting off scot-free there. Thanks for your time Thank you. again, Patrick.